what use is a knife without a handle? And um, when they get to that stage, you normally put them in the bin. Um, and we, the other thing is we've got lots of the knives like that in the collection, either because the handles were broken or because they never got the handles in the first place. But, um, you, you know, we, we, we take the handle a bit for granted. And I think if you, if you said to anybody out there, what's Sheffield famous for? They'll all say knives and tools and whatever. They probably won't say, oh, it's famous for handles. But anyway, um, that's what we're going to unpack a little bit today and other things. So I just thought a little, a little bit of a timeline. Um, 400 to 1400 AD, wooden handles, bone, cow, horn, deer, leather. Uh, between 1300 and 1400, the emergence of the use of ivory. And that's probably the emergence of the use of ivory in Britain. It might have been used in other places well before that. Um, interesting that some elements of handle making were related to Christian festivals. So jet or ebony, you know, jet or ebony, uh, lent. I've got a soft spot for gent because my ancestors came from Whitby. Um, white ivory on mother of pearl Easter. And the other thing, of course, often it was scales, not solid handles. We'll mention scales a bit as we go further on. Interesting, in the inventory of John Watts, who was essentially a merchant in London in 1671, he had nine Sheffield knives were three shillings a dozen. Uh, ivory handled, he had 22 lots of knives and they were eight shillings a dozen. And a material we're not really going to talk about today, but it shows you that sort of hierarchy of value. Tortoise shell, he only had three of them, but they were 13 shillings a dozen. 1624, we've got the incorporation of the Cutler's Company. And I suppose one of the interesting things there is the Cutler's Company has got an elephant slap bang in the middle. So it's highlighting that thing. Um, yeah, interesting. You still do get, and there's a few outdoor companies that have still got elephants in their logo. So, but again, I suppose another thread in, you know, that's going to run through all of this in a way is, you know, that whole thing about the status of ivory. Clearly, it was really important in the past. It was valued in the past. And yet today, that's almost a taboo subject. And certainly, you know, we couldn't be selling any things with ivory at the moment. And, you know, bringing it up to 1864, we got the emergence of synthetic materials. The most commonly known one is xylenite. And uh, if I had a tenor for the number of people who've come up to me and said, oh, I used to have some of them bone handle knives, what they're really saying, they weren't bone handle at all. They were actually xylenite, they were that sort of plastic, which were made in the million. And, um, you know, lots of them still around today. I know the talk was called um, Horn, Ivory and Pearl, but actually I thought bone actually still featured a place, probably wasn't such a crowd for a bowl, but, you know, cheapest and most readily available material. And actually this was a waste material from butchery and tanning. And I suppose one of the features of people in the past is they didn't waste anything. You know, everything got used. And so, you know, you're butchering or you're making leather. You've got lots of bones left over. What can you do with them? Well, some of that can be used for handle purposes. Legs of cattle between the hoof and the knee. 1855, there's between four and 500 tons being supplied to Sheffield for cutlery handles and scales. And one of the... Well, it's one of the usual things is lots of these commodities actually came from London. It, so it wasn't just as if, you know, well, we'll just, uh, we'll just send somebody out to the Mayfield Valley, Valley and see if they can grab a couple of cows and we'll have the bones. You know, there was something about getting these things in large quantities. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine them arriving either by canal and then they would have to have gone out to the different um, manufacturers or latterly when the train came. You, know, you can imagine that scene at Sheffield Railway Station with, you know, um, Wagons full of horn, wagons full of ivory, wagons full of um, other things that went with it. Um, in 1861, census, workers in bone were the largest group of people employed in the cutlery industry. So, it, you know, uh, that, that's quite interesting. And we had bone cutters and bone scalers. Also, that thing, the notion about buttons. There's some industries that go with this. And one of the byproducts of the, um, the handle was what did you, the little bitch had left over. And one of the things you could do, you could make them out of, uh, you could make buttons out of bones. And the other thing was dust. What was left over at the end of this had a value. You know, and I guess many of you, if you're gardeners, you know, you might get the old fish blood and bone meal. What's the main ingredient of fish blood and bone meal? Well, actually, a lot of it is bone dust. So, again, nothing was wasted. And so a question that, you know, asked a lot is, how can we recognise something that is made of bone? And you can see that close up you've got those little brown flecks in it. So when you go home tonight and you go look at those knives that you thought, oh, I thought they were bone handled. Well, if there's no little brown flecks in it, they're probably synthetic or they've gone the posh end and they've actually been made of ivory. 
So here's some knives in the collection with bone handles. So, you know, they look like they've got a bit of age to them, these, don't they? Probably around, probably around 1850. Um, and you can, you can see that um, some of them have got like... Um, a partition in the middle and that's this notion of scales where essentially the middle of the handle is made of metal and the scales are just thin bits that have been essentially uh, riveted onto either side and certainly very typical of pocket knives and there's certainly some up there that look like that and you know well the, the people who've cut these um, the ribbing on the handles one is obviously to give a good grip and the other one is to be a bit decorative um, I think as looking at them now, we probably think, oh, they look a bit scruffy, those. But actually, at the time, people probably celebrated those and thought, actually, they're all right and quite useful. And the blades of those before uh, stainless steel would have been sheer steel. Um, this is just a thing called a pocket flame. And I'm, I suspect looking at this afterwards, this is probably a bit of horn, but it's just that bit cruder and it's a flat scale. And these were things that were used by vets or farmers, essentially just for bleeding animals and um, quite interesting objects. And... That's one that's in the collection, because you can see it's got an accession number on it. These are a few decorative items that I've sort of brought in. So one of the common patterns was this, this twisted handle. And, I, well, I'm sure it's the case now. There's nobody in Sheffield that would have the ability to do that anymore. Um, and, yeah, so um, was it done in some sort of spinning motion and somebody held something on and did it? Or, or was it static when they did it? But, you know, barley twist is the name that it's referred to. And you'll get mother of pearl stuff with barley twist. You'll get ivory things with barley twist. And you'll get bone things with um, barley twist. So the same craftspeople would have had the skills to do that. This is something, a lady called Joan Unwin, who's the curator of the uh, collection at the Cutlass Hall and used to work with Ken Hawley. Um, so she did some research about the Sheffield flood and the number of claims relating to the types of material. And bearing in mind, then, this would have just been the flood route. This wasn't all of Sheffield, so this would have been down the, down the Don Valley. So 45 individuals were claiming for um, loss of items to do with bone. Um, 43 with ivory. Quite interesting. Never occurred to me that billiard balls were made of ivory. Um, cigar cases, ivory knives, forks, lockets, pen knives... I'm not sure what vegetable ivory refers to. I don't know. Visit it in cards. Um, pearl. It's interesting in the pearl, you know, they list the pearl ash. And presumably, again, that's a bit of waste material. Pen knives. Horn. Dust. Horn cuts. Press scales. Scales. Tobacco, tobacco pipes. Again, something made of horn. And, and so it goes on. Um, and it, interesting at the bottom, you know, almost everybody working these materials had quantities of dust which had a value. Um, and obviously, horn and stag are a bit can be sort of interspersed from each other, so uh, maybe they were actually the biggest category. Um, just an advert there, you know, um, Horn Button Manufacturer, the Riverworks, Granville Street, Park, Sheffield, uh, 1861, dealer in bones and hooves, and he's added to his card that he was actually the director. Um, and then, you know, an auction, I'd imagine if, well, an auction, I hadn't looked at that figure before, so it says about 20,000. Uh, buttons for sale. So if you're, going to, if you're going to buy buttons, why don't you buy them in bulk? Buy 20,000 at the same time. Um, but then it says 20,000, about 20,000 cross and scales and very superior working tools and appliances. So these were some of the examples of the claims that were relating to horn. So moved on from bone, just have a look at horn. Um, and in here, there are some claims for ivory, but if you look down that list and then you get to the second sort of section, so there's old Robert Armitage, and he's got 432 press scales, 432 buffalo horn scales, stag scales, buffalo greyhounds. And then you go around the next one, Michael Hunter, 20 to 30,000 bones and bone length. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, when you put an insurance claim and you've got to sort of verify how do they know you had what they were claiming for? So how on earth he proved he had that, that, that amount of money? I don't know. And then 121,000 bone, various handles, bone, stag and horn dust. You know, Nicholas Holman. So he was claiming for 15 tons of bone dust and 115 tons of bone ash. So again, so quite staggering and just just that notion of we look at the finished products but there's really quite a story uh, that goes behind them so the scale of this is the horn handle industry so 1850 145 firms employing over a thousand people peak of the trade 1880 to 1900 
So, you know, we've got a few variations. So, buffalo horn. So, if you get something that's got a bit of blackness in the handle, uh, that, that tends to be more the buffalo horn. Um, one of the things is, I assumed before I was preparing this talk that life was just pretty simple. They just put an order into Balmoral, Scotland, or somewhere and say, send us down a load of staghorns. Actually, staghorn from Scotland was pretty unsuitable. It was too soft in the middle. So, they were importing them from, you know, when it says Cape, that's South Africa, presumably, 350,000. 200,000 Australian horns, 150 tons of Calcutta rocks, 100 tons of Madras, you know. So it, it was coming from everywhere. And again, just imagine all this stuff, it's going to London by ship, and it's, somehow it's getting from London up to Sheffield and then bursting out of the station in, you know, Victoria Station, Midland Station, carts carrying that stuff. Um, whether it was smelly or not, I don't know, but I suspect it would have been. Um, you know, 72,000 stag handles and scales used per week. So really quite... Quite staggering the scale of this. Uh, this building's still around in Sheffield on, on Broom Close. And the horn handle works, and actually, some of the things they were making were walking sticks and umbrellas. And there's a company called Regather, the people who used to organise the folk forest down at um, Encliffe Park, and, and they do a lot of distribution of um, sort of food, you know, very ethical things. Well, they're actually based in there, and about four years ago, they came down and said, can we borrow any things from the collection just to, you know, give the authenticity to that? And we, we lent them some walking sticks and umbrella handles. So, again, um, it wasn't just cutlery. So, just the range of uses. Um, a, a, you know, massive list of things there. Handles for machetes, swords, pistols, uh, razor scales, razor strop handles, um, door furniture, corkscrews, bicycle handles. I mean, all the things that we think about where now we'd think rubber or plastic, what did you do in, you know, in 1850, 1860? What were the sort of things that you were going to put in there? Uh, some jewellery, pen holders, golf clubs, golf club sides, violin chin rests, you know. I don't know if there's any violin players here, but um, you need to think about those things. Riding stirrups, tea and coffee pot handles, gun plates, pistol caps, revolver plates. Um, telephone mouthpieces and album packs. So, you know, the range of things that you could have used that horn from. But I, I suppose it's that notion of taking the raw material and getting it into the right shape. So you're, you're either going to have to essentially cut the shape out of that horn or you're going to have to soften it to, in, to, to, to such a fashion that you can actually shape that. And most of the horn that was used in things was actually pressed and it was processed. I've got some decorative items here, most of which are on the back. Um, and so, you know, I suppose if you think about a horn, it, it wouldn't be in those nice straight bits. So it's been pressed and it's been processed. And before then, it's actually been, it's been softened to get you into that position. And, you know, the bits on the end, the caps or the finials, some of them are really smart. And one of the problems, of course, was that at the end of a horn, well, some bits of it have got a natural point on the end. So those bits were often used as the handle. But if you cut chopping lengths from it, you end up with a, a blunt end, essentially, which doesn't look very attractive. And in fact, is exposing either hollowness or a softer material. So you needed to think, what are we going to do to finish that off? So it created a whole industry in Sheffield. And this would have been true also of, of the ivory, um, that you needed to cap it and put something on that's elaborate. And, but, you know, when you put those things together, you're talking here, you know, quite high status objects. Um, the one on the left, certainly that end's got a, it's got a hallmark on it, so, that, so that's silver plated. Um, so I said buffalo horn, things that are looking sort of that sort of greyness. So these are the sort of things that would have been typical of, of buffalo horn. The one on the right there, clear, you can see that scales, it's got pins going through it. Um, and, it, you know, I guess in a sense, there would have come a point where you had a choice. Did you want mother of pearl? Did you want buffalo horn? Did you want cow? Did you want bone? Um, and it, essentially, it was the price and what, what was the thing that was going to impress your neighbours. Um, these are quite nice sets. The cheese set is on the side there. Um, and, and carving sets, they were a common thing for, um, for antler horn. And again, you can see that on the, the carving set on the left, all of them have got a metal cap on the bottom to get around that problem. We don't just want the scruffy cut off bit of horn. Uh, it's going to look like that. Um, the interesting thing about some of these sets, like the cheese set, does that look like it's ever been used? I suspect not, but a beautiful item and uh, ivory. And actually the word is ivory teeth. They didn't talk about tusks in the Sheffield. Um, so 1880, 675 tonnes of ivory imported into Great Britain from Egypt, Africa and the British East Indies. 1883, one company reputedly had ivory to the value of 
$400,000, which in today's money is 10.5 million pounds. Uh, 1883, one ton of ivory uh, cost 900,000 pounds in today's money. And this is the store of Joseph Rogers ivory. And those, um, those large tusks on the left are, uh, I think they're nine foot high. There were different sorts of ivory. So green ivory, which was the best quality, West Africa, Cameroon, Angola. Good for piano keys. He went not mentioned piano keys up to now. Um, I, I don't know, why, why don't the Chinese, when they want ivory, just buy up old pianos? Because nobody wants them, and they, you know, there's a load of ivory there, but anyway. Um, but used for expensive items. Uh, interesting, the concept of white ivory, uh, which was bleached in the sun and had come from elephant graveyards. So again, I've got to admit, I don't know a lot about the habits of elephants, but one of the things is elephants, they, they, there's a sort of, they'd go back to die in the place where they're, I don't know whether they have been born there or their ancestors, but you did get these substantial elephant graveyards. So one source of ivory, which sounds okay, was to go, if you found an elephant graveyard, um, you know, you were in luck, it was worth a lot of money, and you didn't have to go around killing the elephants. Um, but So regular sales in London and Liverpool, and a quarter of all the ivory sold ended up in Sheffield. As I say, there were a whole range of other products, like pianos, like billiard balls, so, yeah. And different parts of the, the, the teeth were used for different purposes. Again, before I did this talk, I didn't realise whether they were hollow or not. So basically, a third of the elephant tusk is solid, the sort of tip end, so that's good for making a billiard ball. Um, and actually the rest of it is hollow and that might influence um, how it's made. And, and we'll see a picture later of somebody, some, somebody cutting, cutting, cutting that up. But, so again, the point and end would have a higher value than some of the, some of the, some of the, some of the other bits of that. So the, yeah, these tusks, the, these were the sort of show tusks from Joseph Rogers, nine foot tall, 21 inches across. I mean, on there, the table there, there is a large piece of elephant tusk, but it's nothing like the scale of this. And the small teeth of tusks was known as scribblos. So there's another... You know, when you want to put that on a Scrabble board, you can uh, impress people. Uh, between 1973 and 1981, imports to Great Britain, 5,286 tonnes. The next statistic is the one that sort of blew me away a little bit. And, and it's sadly, in a way, you know, this represents 296,016 pairs of tusks. So in other words, 296,000 elephants. Um, and it's interesting, so this article was in the Ironmonger on the 20th of January, 1883. This rate of destruction, it will be seen how rapidly this noble animal will disappear and how surely ivory will become a thing of the past. There are doubtlessly large quantities remain in the interior of the African continent, but with the rapid advance of civilised man and the temptation of increasingly high prices, they will soon be discovered and exhausted. So even in 1883, they were actually worried about the sort of extinction of elephants. Uh, ivory products again, carving set on the left, uh, fish serving set on the right. Um, so again, it could be carved. You had the same problem that you needed to finish off the ends. So you needed to put um, finials on you know, something that was going to look smart. So ivory cutlery was essentially the top of the range. It was good quality. It was durable. Could be carved into different shapes. It would split if left in hot water. So you know, generally hot water and obviously latterly dishwashers is not good for any any sort of smart cutlery. Uh, the handles were often shaped to get a better grip. And so on the right here, this is a James Deakin um, cutlery set. And it, you know, so the set is 41 pounds um, or 48 pounds, depending. But, but basically with ivory handles to the cutlery. So you're basically adding 25% to the cost of the product if you wanted the ivory handles on there. Um, and that was a choice you would have had. The cheaper choice would have either been bone or latterly it would have been xylanite, it would have been, would have, would have been the synthetic material. So ivory was, obviously it was quality. So on the left hand side there we've got a few, a, a few sort of examples. Um, there was a fashion for dyeing ivory green. So sometimes when you see something that is green, it's dyed ivory and that was again, you know, a sort of step up from bog standard ivory. Um, the bits of carving to the right, quite impressive that's some of the Smith stuff that came to us from Dennis Smith and the, those handles are on the back how you how you do that bit about carving almost like inside the handle Unbe unbelievable skill you almost imagine something like that to be like Chinese and uh, when you see things like the Antiques Roadshow and, and you can we talked about the novel so the, the sort of second item in from the left there you, you can see it's got novels and presumably that was to give it a grip whatever whatever you're actually holding some downsides to ivory so very often now if 
um, if you try buying cutlery and it's got a split handle, that's probably a giveaway that the split was actually something to do, it's to do with ivory, probably because it's been in water. And the other thing, it does have a tendency to sort of, uh, some bits of it seem to orange up a bit and other bits of it seem to fade. Now that could have been smoke in people's houses or it could have just been something that's been caught in the sunlight. So sometimes you'll see a set of, I don't know, say fish knives and forks and the, all the handles won't be the same colour. So there is some um, discoloration in there. One of the joys about working with the Hawley Collection, you can open a box and we've got some boxes and they're just called ephemera. Okay, and they're, essentially they were about the, uh, the cutlery industry and the handles, but just to open the box and find these things out. So this guy, Walter, 57 year old, he was the last ivory cutter in Sheffield. Um, he was called Swift and he worked for a company that was called Swift, uh, which is quite interesting. But you can see him there um, measuring up the tusks um, and I guess if the tusk was big enough, the, even if it was hollow, you were going to be able to cut a number of handles out of the, um, what was left of the sort of diameter. Um, and he, he's obviously sizing things up, but again, the, the quantity that he's got behind him, um, and taking those, I suppose, different sized, uh, handle tusks and teeth and turning them into uniform sized keys was clearly quite an art. Um, as with a few other things we're going to see, you can see the, uh, the obvious health and safety lack of, um, you know, bare hands, um, doing that all day long. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised he's got any fingers left at all. I mean, he is wearing glasses, which I guess he needed to. They're probably not safety glasses, but um, good to see that. This is something we've got in the collection. Um, and moving on to Mother of Pearl, which sometimes is called Nacre, okay? And this knife, I think it's something like, it's actually got the date stamped on it and it says 1785. And so you can see the value of that product, you know, a very small amount of something, you know, like when we get gold inlay, it's because the gold is very expensive and it's, you know, and, and here at that point in time, that mother of pearl was very expensive, but it was something that could be worked into a nice decorative pattern. And again, this is a knife we've acquired quite recently in the collection from Dennis Smith. So in the 1861 census, there were 28 pearl cutters, 25 pearl button makers, including four women. And of these, half had come from Birmingham. It is interesting when you, when I'm talking about cutlery, I'll say to people, 95% of all cutlery was made in Sheffield. Well, I suspect the other 5%, a lot of that was in Birmingham. And often mother of pearl was definitely something that was worked in Birmingham and in Sheffield. Um, and maybe that's because there was related industries like the button industry. There was a smaller group of people who were capable of carving the mother of pearl and their, the terminology for that is fluters. And, and you know, some of them would have worked on pearl and some of them would have worked on ivory. Um, there were inlayers who made the shields that were common on pen and pocket knives and other decorative items. And this was a highly skilled job um, because pearl cracks easily. And these inlayers used a two leg parser to cut the shape to a given length. And you might think, what is he talking about? Well, there's a nice picture here. So this is a uh, Stan Shaw, who's left us recently. He died a year ago, but actually, so you can see he's got this quite elaborate contraption. He's got a belt on with a sort of breastplate. He's got what looks like a violin bow. He's got a spinning bobbin and this, this parser. He's actually cutting out a shape in a bit of mother and pearl to produce a shield like that. So. Um, again, the whole skill of cutting out the shape and then actually making the shield to put in there. And of course, what Stan did, Stan made everything. He was making the blades, he was making the, uh, the scales, he, you know, he was doing the lot. And uh, he, he'd followed up lots of these crafts. Well, where did the Mother of Pearl come from? Well, I love that. I think if you said to me, what's my favourite photograph in the collection? It's this one on the left hand side, because in some ways it's almost just so outrageous. So this is the Australian Pavilion at the Wembley exhibition in 1925. And I don't know, you know, are there any blokes in those suits or not? But um, quite cumbersome wearing one of those suits in 1925 and saying, you know, 1925, put one of these on, jump off the side of a boat, get to the bottom and pick as many shells as you can. And oh, we've probably got enough air for, I don't know, half an hour or whatever. Um, and, and you can see the shells behind them sort of stacked up. 
Uh, right-hand side is a slightly more cruder version, where it's right lads, jump over, the, jump, jump over, dive as deep as you can, grab as many shells as you can. Probably Indonesia, the right-hand photograph, whereas the left-hand photograph is actually Australia. Okay, but I think, um, again, we take for granted, you know, where, where these things come from. And this is interesting, you know, we talked about a lot of these things coming into London, Liverpool. Well, here we've got, you know, the market. So if you were in Sheffield and you wanted some mother of pearl for your uh, cutlery sets, you'd have to go down to London and have a look at it and buy it, unless you trusted the merchants so much that it was a good, you know, regular supplier and they, they would deliver the things for you. And that's, you know, St. Catherine's Dock, which is, you now we'll have some trendy accommodation on it. We don't know exactly how many people and how many companies, but, you know, there's three companies that we can sort of identify. Um, and there weren't many of them, but, and, you know, this is a black and white advert, you know, you can tell from the telephone number being 4290, um, being quite an old thing, but um, one day I'm going to do a talk on Arundel Street. I need to do a lot of research about Arundel Street, but there's so many companies address is Arundel Street. Um, but again, here we've got manufacturers of all kinds of buttons. Now, we've got that word novelties, you know, whatever that is. Um, but, you know, the nice thing, the luster of Mother of Pearl, the shininess of the Mother of Pearl, just as that sense of uh, something that's quite attractive. Handles and scales for the cutlery trade thrown in, so, yeah. So one of the companies was George Savile. Um, and, you know, this is one of the things, again, we've acquired in the collection in the last two or three years. Was this something to go in a shop front as an advert to say, come on in and buy what we've got, look what we've got? Or I think more likely this was the sort of thing, you know, you had a few bob and you were inviting people around for dinner in a Victorian household and you thought, we're going to put something in the middle of the table that is more impressive than the people who are coming for meal had on their table. Um, and that was quite a common thing for the Victorians to do. And um, so, you know, shell, centrepiece. Either way, it's a beautiful object and it's fabulous there. It's on the, it's on the table at the back. Um, and we, fortunately, we, the, the same time we acquired that, we've acquired a catalogue from George Savile. So not only did you have that notion again, OK, I want to go out and buy some dessert knives with Mother of Pearl handles, you've actually got the choice of 20 different shapes for your handles. Um, and each one of those would have actually had a name. Um, so, for instance, the bottom right one would have been known as a tulip pattern. Uh, I don't know the names of the others, and it's another bit of work I'll have to do at some point, but just to, just to identify. So people would have known the pattern, and some of them involved more intricate work than the others. And the other one, of course, is something we haven't really mentioned much before, is razors. Okay? Um, and so razors had scales on them, and some of them would have had, um, some of them would have had mother, mother of pearl. Uh, I like this nice one, um, caviar. You know, let's, let's, let's keep the standards up, let's, let's go for it. Um, was caviar more common in Victorian times than it is today? I don't know. I won't ask you to put your hand up if you've had caviar in the last uh, six months, and it's probably not PC at the moment, but anyway. Um, but, you know, so all sorts of things to eat caviar with, and salt and mustard spoons. And one of the things, again, I've realised is it, it's pretty durable, mother of pearl. Uh, I know we said it could be chipped when you're cutting it, um, but actually it's quite robust, so it, it's not as if those things are really... Uh, break up revolver butts again that wasn't something uh, I was expecting um, we've got teapot lids there you know um, nail cleaners cigarette tubes I don't want that horrible cigarette in my mouth but I'm gonna have a you know a, a, a mother of pearl thing to do that and finally dominoes you, you know I bet there's people here thinking I haven't got any ivory in my house you need to go and look at the dominoes because they could be the secret ingredient just a bit of paperwork that came from George Savile, and essentially, you know, this seems to be saying, um, we've bought a load of mother of pearl off you, and actually, we can't use it anymore. Nobody wants to buy it. So it's that sort of, uh, that notion of decline. This is in 1955. Um, on the top right there, there was a little thing about um, saying, um, you know, we send you our new report, uh, pearl buttons, the work just completed it contains the latest information covering fresh water mussel shells. So again, you know, in the mother of pearl hierarchy, some of the shells were more valuable than others. And so if you've got fresh water, you know, shells, they were, they, they were even better. And again, this, I think this sums up just some notion about something like a letterhead. It has no financial value whatsoever. 
you know, but actually to our collection to tell a little bit of that story. And it, you know, it tells you uh, where the company was located, what the telephone number was. It might tell you a little bit about what they made and who knows what that little bit of logo was, but every company had to have the logo. Third company, the, the, the Gillets. And we've got a couple of, we've got Steve Gillett here today, so we've got, got that link there. And um, I suppose I used to love this little picture on the right of the Pearl Works, which is now a Tesco's. Um, again, where is it? You know, Air Lane, just behind Arundel Gate. Um, and the other thing I discovered while doing this talk is there was more than one Pearl Works, just like there was more than one Portland Works in Sheffield. So if you were making Mother of Pearl, you might have called the place you were working from the Pearl Works. But um, partnership between George William Gillett and Edward Arnold, both lived in Dover Street. They rented 38 Arundel Street. There we are, you know, get the Arundel Street in again. 1923, moved to dedicated premises is Air Lane, the Pearl Works, employed 10 to 20 workers. The last owner, Michael Gillett, relocated the works to Dromfield, 1989. You know, so it's, it, it's fabulous that, again, one of the things we can do by looking at this at this point in time is we can actually have some links um, to, the, to the people who are still around. And the firm was only dissolved in 2012. So 10 years ago, we could have added to her. There's the Pearl Works again. Just where, where if, if you can work out that it's located and uh, Keith put us a map on there. But I say, sadly, that was, it, it wasn't sort of uh, valuable enough, the building, to be preserved. So it's something that's disappeared. And I don't know. Should have been like a Banksy, that, you know, somebody should have cut it out and preserved it. But I don't, I suspect the uh, demolition contractors probably didn't think likewise. Uh, Steve has got the ledgers from this company. And one of the things is it just shows you the in interdependence of the trades. And this reads like a who's who of the Sheffield cutlery industry. So you've got things like there, Allen and Darwin, Savage, uh, Dickinson, uh, Webb, Hammond and Creek, Joseph Elliott, um, well, Watson and Gillett, which clearly has link link links with the family there, uh, Morris Bohm, who was an an another sort of cutlery maker, Roberts and Belk. So essentially... You know, lots of the cutlery companies, they weren't producing their own mother of pearl handles. They were buying them in. Um, and again, uh, some of these companies probably were based on our own street. Oh, they wouldn't have been far away. But, you know, we've talked about all that hubbub of activity of stuff arriving at the station and being spread out among Sheffield. Well, there was also lots of people taking packages of all sorts of different things between the cutlery manufacturers because that sense of uh, interdependence between them. And there we've got, you know, Joseph and Herbert Gillett. So on the left, another bit of that, um, I don't know, what's he doing? Is he having a look at that shell thinking, what can I make out of this? And then, and also this notion that if you take the whole shell, um, there was a sense that it wasn't, all of it wasn't suitable, all of it wasn't thick enough. So basically it was about, you know, you bought this, you want to get the best value out of it. You're going to see a little bit of a video clip, which is also of Gillett's. And I would say three things to look out for. One is the size of the shell. Um, secondly, the health and safety uh, that you think is going on. And the third thing is, in the process of cutting mother of pearl, there was a danger it would go black, it would essentially burn. So essentially they're using running water. The video clip only lasts...
I suppose to some extent it was all about quality. Um, so uh, Steve's family have got some pictures of the uh, jewellery being made from Mother of Pearl. Um, that's, that's something that we actually don't think of. The handles on the left, um, some particularly decorative objects there. I'm just going to tell a couple of anecdotes that Steve told me. Um, and you, you can ask him afterwards. So, so one was um, of his dad uh, going to buy uh, basically the shells. They used to get them from a merchant in London. Merchant closed down. They were getting them from abroad and they were coming back and they weren't of suitable quality. So his dad would go out to in Indonesia and pick his own shells. And then he would bring them back in a suitcase. Can you imagine it when you turn up at customs and they say anything to declare? So you put the suitcase on it, open the suitcase, and you've got a suitcase full of shells. And also his dad, who was well organised, actually said, and here's the duty that I'm going to pay on them. And needless to say, the people in customs didn't quite know how to handle that. The other thing that was interesting is so the we, we said about nothing getting wasted. So the offcuts from Gillett's ended up going to Bethlehem. And basically to provide either, you could either some elements of tourist trinkets or things like bits for inlay for the front covers of Bibles and things like that. So nothing was wasted. Um, on that nothing is wasted theme is I forgot to say that sometimes after they'd made the handles and the buttons, the dust that was left over could be used to make toothpaste. Uh, and people in Sheffield do dig up shells in their garden that have got holes in where buttons have actually been cut out. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, um, it, it's really interesting and uh, capturing the sort of information that we've got here. Some of the uh, Gillett's produce there displayed uh, latterly. Some lovely decorated items here. So that's the end of that. Um, just a few acknowledgements. Geoffrey Tweedale, who provides with lots of information. Joan Unwin from the Cutlass Hall, the Gillett family. Lily, who rescued a lot of that stuff from George Saville. And obviously, it's Ken Hawley, who had the foresight to collect some of these sort of elements of the collection together. Um, well, we've got some new people with us tonight, so just going to say a little bit as we finish about the Knife Project. <clears throat> the Knife Project came around because I was sorting out the knives at the Holy Collection, um, deciding what we should keep, what we shouldn't keep, how we should organise them. And I realised that we had knives with 800 different surnames stamped on them. Um, this is inaccurate now because probably during the life of the project, which is now being running about a year and a half, we're probably up to 1,200 different surnames. We originally thought of creating a physical knife wall, like a war memorial, where you would have gone down to the museum and you'd, in many cases, you'd gone and looked for your own name. The knives are all different sizes, however, and some of them are not easy to read because the etching's not very good. So we decided to make a digital product. And actually with COVID, this has been absolutely perfect. And a couple of the aims of this project, one was to get younger people into the museum and get excited about possibly seeing their own surname on a knife blade. And the other notion was that actually there are quite a lot of people in Sheffield who have got some information about the cutlery industry or firms or memorabilia that doesn't have great value, but tells a little bit of the story. And just today, this morning, somebody who worked for Richards has come in and given us a collection of maybe 50 pen knives and lots of catalogues and information about the company. <clears throat> and somebody who attended the earlier talk actually had quite a lot of significant amount of information about mapping and web. And we do feel there's an opportunity at the moment just to capture these things. So, and, and again, sometimes it might be you've got something in the, uh, some information in the family and you don't want to part with it, but you'd be very happy for us to copy it. Or other, it might be you've got some things that you think the kids don't want these, but they might be of some interest in the museum. So we, we, we're, defi we're definitely interested in that, in that notion. And, and this, is the, this is the online tool that you can use your smartphone, you can use your computer. Um, you can also use two touch screens down in the gallery. So if you just put in Hawley Sheffield knives, very simple thing, then you can put the first, um, the first initial of your family name. And out of that, you can, you can see whether there was um, a cutlery company with your name on it. And I say, we've now got 1200 different names in there. I was really pleased last week, I led a lady to the screen and um, she was looking at the text and pointed to a name and said, that was my granddad. And that's, 
that's if you like exactly what we want to do so by and large on there we'll have a picture of the knife we might have a bit of location information all this history has come from a book by Jeffrey Tweedale we're incredibly grateful to him for giving us this information um, and it does mean if you had an interest in a cutlery company it's a way in which you could look that information up without buying a book that's 650 pages long So that's the name of the knife blade project. Um, we've we've catalogued something now like I think two and a half thousand knives, and essentially we think we have the biggest collection of table knives in the world. Um, there are obviously three cutlery collections in Sheffield. There's the Cutlers Hall that have a lot of nice, fancy and historical stuff. Um, there's the Millennium Galleries, again, they've got a lot, lot of nice, fancy and historical stuff. But the Hawley collection, we're telling the story of how things were made and some of the more um, ordinary products, if you like. So. Um, you're very welcome to come and visit. Good news about Kellam Island, it's now actually free. Um, it's, it's, it's joined with the other museums. So it, there's a real opportunity there just to, uh, just to come and visit. So um, that's the end of what I've got to say tonight. I'm very happy to, to answer any questions afterwards, um, either about mapping and web or anything just generally uh, about cutlery. Also worth mentioning, we've got a YouTube channel, the Ken Hawley Collection Trust. This talk will go on there afterwards. Some of our other talks are on there. 